26,312. 26,312. I was asked to get up here today and tell you a little bit about Sedgwick, a little bit about our business model. We're one of those private equity owned companies that you've heard about lately. A little bit about what's going to happen in the insurance industry from the TPA standpoint into the future. But let me tell you what our industry is all about. This is the description of the company. Today, while we sit here in this room, 26,312 people got up today and they thought they were going to work or driving their automobile or buying a product or taking care of their family and something happened that they didn't think was going to happen. They got hurt at work. They got in a car accident. They found out they had cancer. They found out they were pregnant or their house caught on fire. But today, over 26,000 people picked up the phone and called Sedgwick as just one TPA. And by the end of today, somebody in our organization is going to let them know that it's going to be okay. That all of the promises you made as brokers or agents or carriers or underwriters, all those promises came true today for those 26,000 people. And that's what we do for a living. And we do it with about 13,000 people located all over the country in 480 locations. And funny, when I hear it described even after 20 years as the largest TPA in the world, we never set out to do that. That was not our objective. I'm going to tell you a little bit later some of the incredible flaws in our business strategy. And how we got here today, sometimes we sit back and scratch our heads and say, geez, how, how did we get through all of that? But I would tell you that the claims business may be like yours. I, I don't, I barely know this one. I'm not, I wouldn't speak for yours. It's not, it's not a complicated business. It's just complex, right? It's, it's a, that's a great saying. It's not complicated. It's the service business that we're in. But let me tell you a little bit about the business model first, because you heard a lot um, recently about private equity and we're one of those companies. So I've been with the company for 20 years, and when I first got there, we were owned by Sedgwick, which at the time was a insurance brokerage operation out of the UK. It used to be Fred S. James here in the United States and was acquired by um, Sedgwick PLC. And we, on the claim side, were a very small little division within that company. When Marsh bought the company, the Sedgwick brokerage company, we had an agreement that I didn't want to be owned by an $8 billion company and they didn't want to be in the claims business. So we had a, a very good mutual agreement for that, uh, for those few months. And we bought the company using private equity funds to separate out from Marsh. And we chose private equity because we were trying to figure out what is the structure we want to use to allow us to achieve the mission that we wanted. And, and again, as I said, it's not complicated. We wanted to take care of our people and we wanted our people to take care of our customers. And I didn't want to be confused. I'm one of those maybe many CEOs that I have no desire to ever be a public company. And I know there are great, great examples of why that's a wonderful structure, equity structure. But we found that private equity for us was the structure that allowed us to pay attention to our colleagues, they take care of our customers, and our customers would take care of us. And that is the simple business model that we have. In 1998, when we bought the company from Marsh, we bought it for $105 million. At the time uh, that I got to the company, we had 500 colleagues. We did about $5 million in EBITDA. Uh, this year, we'll do $1.6 billion. We have uh, 13,000 colleagues, as I said. In that 20-year period, basically, we've grown the company 32 times in revenue and 52 times larger in EBITDA. We'll do 270 million or so in EBITDA this year. And throughout that history, we found that this private equity model gave us the ability to keep that focus and keep taking care of customers. Because as I said, we're in the service business. So if we don't invest in technology and we don't invest in people, we don't have a product. Now, unlike some of the other combination conversations and unlike some of your business models, we have a very high recurring revenue base. And that's part of what allows the private equity model to work so well for us. So we've had a lot of private equity investors in the uh, 
basically 17 years that I've been the CEO, when we've been private equity owned, we've sold the company five times and done a full refinancing two additional times. So seven times essentially, we've gone to the private debt markets and sold the company completely. And in those seven times that we've sold the company, we've never once, never once, laid off a human being. We don't lay off people, we don't cut costs just before we sell, we don't pump up revenue numbers just before we go to the market. We basically go to the market and say, this is our story. This is our business strategy. This is why we add value to the insurance proposition. And we found that the marketplace responds to that. So we sold for 105, 107 million at the start. If you go to most recent times in 2010, we had, uh, we sold to Stone Point and Hellman Friedman for 1.2 billion. Uh, 42 months later, we sold to KKR for 2.4 billion. So there's lots of ways of great creating value and growing it if you believe in your model, you believe in your story, and you can articulate it to the private equity markets, uh, they'll respond to it. So we've been a, a staunch supporter of it um, throughout all of those times. And our leadership team, again, we've all been here through every one of those sales. So we change private equity investors just like public companies change shareholders. That's our liquidity. The downside, if there's a downside of all of this, and I'd say as an operator like many of you, there's two downsides. One is you do have to sell the company. If you're going to be in the private equity business, they are going to get liquid. It's not that they're going to fall out of in love with you. They're going to love the business. The more they love it, the more likely it is you are going to separate because you create value and the only way to get liquidity is to sell it again. And so as an operator, the beauty of the model is to be in control of that process, to have an extremely good conversation with the board, stay open with them. I have board conversations that are frequent but not consistent. I don't have any board members in this room so I, I can be a little more open about it. I don't want them expecting a Friday call. I don't want them expecting two-day board meetings. I want them to expect that I'm going to tell them what to worry about and I'm going to tell them what to celebrate. And, and the first part sounds obvious, right? You, you, want to, you want to be able to say, I'll tell you what to worry about. You hired me to run the business. I know the business. I can tell you when you should worry and I'll be open enough when you, with you to do that. It's equally important, I believe, to tell them when to celebrate. Because if we have a great month or a great quarter, and I don't tell them to be careful about that, they'll think we're gonna do it again, right? So you gotta, you gotta help them both ways, when to worry and when not to worry, but get them to trust you to be open and have conversations with them. So I reach out, talk to the board on a very frequent basis, but an inconsistent basis intentionally, so they know when those phone calls come in, it's something they ought to pay attention to. The private equity model um, for us works for a number of reasons in our particular business model. I mentioned recurring revenue. We are in the long-term contract business. TPAs basically fall into two categories. Those that are third-party claims administrators that have administrative contracts are typically one to five years in length. And then there's the loss adjusters, right? They get the one-off claims that come in from property storms or carrier assignments and others. And some of us are in both businesses. So we're primarily in that TPA, that long-term contract business. So as a result of that, in the 20 years that I've been the CEO, the lowest rollover, we call it, the lowest retention from one year to the next that we've had is 96%. We lost our seventh largest account that year. It's the only top 50 account we've ever lost in 20 years that I've been here. Every other year we run 98, 99%. Sometimes we're even lucky enough to get it up over 100% just because of fee increases and so forth. So you can picture our model versus um, the other models you've heard. When you basically have 100% of your business from last year, everything you sell this year goes to the top line and there's a good growth. So you start telling that strategy, that strategy spin that out to the private equity and they see long-term consistent revenue growth. Our long-term consistent EBITDA, excuse me. <clears throat> Another thing about our model is the majority of our revenue is cost plus revenue. So we have the 
great fortune to have picked a market niche where we do business with most of the largest corporations in the country. I'm from Detroit originally, live in Memphis, Tennessee now, but when I first got to the company, we had no business in Detroit. And if you're in the claims business back in the day, you wanted business in Detroit. They made stuff out of metal. They hurt people making stuff. What a better place to be. <laughs> and we had no business in Detroit. And today we write Ford, General Motors, Chrysler, Toyota, Honda, Delphi, and everybody that supplies products and services to the, to the hotel, to the uh, auto industry. So we moved into a market niche and start growing that niche right up through the, the chain. If you look at our customer base, we have a large position in the retail space, and we got into that by getting Target, one retailer. And Target, we moved up, and today we do Walmart and almost everybody else in the retail space. And have been very good at moving up niche areas. So when the investors look at us and they see these channels, these verticals, and you have a large market share position in them, the fact that we do no construction currently, no oil and gas currently, very little hospitality currently, they, see, they don't see that as a negative sign, they see that as somebody who's focused in other areas because of how we describe and present our business. So in addition to having this high retention, the, the cost plus contracts for these large employers mean that we, we dedicate a high number of colleagues directly to their account charge them all the salary and benefits and a multiplier on top of that. So when you look at the revenue and the EBITDA stream, it's very predictable over time with long-term contracts. And that's what um, causes them a lot of excitement about this particular part of our industry, the TPA industry. We have a very high free cash flow uh, business model because we don't consume a lot of cash like many of you. We have rented space. We're in 480 locations. We don't own a single building. Of those 13,000 people, about all we pay for is, you know, paint and furniture. We invest in our, uh, about 2% of our revenues in CapEx because of the technology spend. But beyond that, it generates a very high CapEx spend. One of the things that, um, I get a chance to talk to other CEOs about, and we start talking about private equity, and they say, oh, God, that's got to be terrible. You know, they're just brutal. They're all over you every month for how do you make more money and stuff. And, and we haven't had that experience. And the experience, uh, part of it is because we are very careful about how we set expectations with the board and with the investors. We sold the company, as I said, uh, now about 18 months ago to KKR, and we told the story, just as you've heard, you tell the story when you're trying to sell the company. I mean, you get somebody to write a check for $2.4 I mean, and we're just claims people. You know, it takes a pretty good story to get that done and a pretty good future. And in the 18 months since we've told that story, we've made budget every single month. Well, it's not a complicated business in dealing with the board if every time you say you're going to do something, you do it. It almost doesn't matter what you say. It matters whether you deliver and whether you occasionally exceed those expectations. So we're very careful in how we tell that story. I've been a buyer and a seller in every one of those transactions that I mentioned to you. So I want us to get a high value going out because I got a lot of options and a lot of stock that I own personally. But I also know that the other side of that story is they're going to cause me to roll over 50% or so of my equity every time. And so I'm a buyer also. So what we set that price at matters a lot to me because I've rolled half of my money into the next deal. So you got to make sure you can keep, uh, keep meeting those expectations every time. I like the private equity as well because you're dealing with an educated group of, of business people that want to understand your business model. And the way we think about our business, because we want to be very transparent with our board, very transparent with our small group of investors, we want them to be smart enough to understand what we do and smart enough to know whether they really wanted to own us or not. Because I'm not a seller that wants to run. I want to stay running the business, and I've been fortunate enough to do that five times. We've only had, we're 45 years old as a company, we've only had two CEOs in our history. I'm the second one and I'm not expecting us to have a third for quite some time. So I want to make sure that 
that they understand the business model that I love and that we've proven we can make money with. And if they love that, then pay for it. If you don't love it, go buy something else. I'm sure you can find some other things to buy. Because if you buy this one, we want you to love this. Because this is the business that I help build and I love. And I want to tell them about that and want them to buy the reality of what we currently are. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our business um, model because it's, a, a, as I said before, it's a little bit different. And I, I used to be reluctant to describe this to people because I felt like that, either, like you, that people have been to the business schools, you bought the book, you read the chapter, you know all the things that you're supposed to do. And we don't do a lot of them. We have no strategic plan. Okay, I've said it. We, we've never had a strategic plan. We don't sit in a room for three days a year and write a strategy and publish it and tell somebody what we're going to do. We never have, and while I'm here, we're not going to do it. And we don't do it for one reason that, that's really important to me. I have seen too many companies that invest an enormous amount of time in developing a strategic plan based on everything they know that's happened in the past year, hoping that it's going to happen again in the next year. And watched a lot of companies through the recent recession, depression, whatever we called it in this country, that had wrote a strategic plan five or six years ago now and followed that plan meticulously to serious revenue and earnings declines. We didn't have a strategic plan. We adapted to the environment throughout. And we have never, in our 45-year history, ever had a year where we had less revenues or less EBITDA than we did the year before. And that's not because the market hasn't changed. It's because we have changed as fast as the market or faster. There's a story within the company that, that is told that we try to chuckle at. We about This happened about eight years or so ago, and we, we sat around talking like this and said, well, that's just ridiculous that we have no strategic plan. Clearly, we have to fix that, that we, we've got, we read the book too, and the fact that we are just reactive to things that happen has got to be wrong. So we hired a consultant, and we spent a lot of time orienting the consultant on who we are and what we did, and we took about 20 people off-site to Florida to do a strategic planning session. And the consultant was well-prepared, got up in front of the group in the morning. I was sitting in the audience, and I'm a terrible audience participant. I lead. I'm not a good team player. I want to be up front. I'm sitting there. I'm trying to be patient. And this consultant's talking, and the room is getting more quiet, more quiet. And, and finally, you could just tell the tone. You feel in your company. I called a, a break, I don't know, hour and a half into the session, walked with the consultant outside, and I said, I'm sorry, this is not going to work. Fired him, and walked back in and said, we, this is not us. And we coined the phrase that day for us, proactively reactive. We said, you know what? If we are just better at reacting to the marketplace than any of our competitors, then who the hell needs a strategy? That's a great strategy, a strategy of saying, let's be quick and nimble and aggressive and go after opportunities when they present themselves. Even if we've never done it before, let's find a way to do it when everybody else is saying no or probably not or we can't go there. We're going, yes. We'll uh, no, we've never even heard of that before, but we'll figure it out. And so um, our, our aversion to the strategic plan is not that we don't like to plan, it's that we don't want a barrier to being very reactive to our customers and to what our colleagues need to taking care of our customers. I don't get any monthly reports. We have 13,000 colleagues. We get millions of claims a year. I have 700 people in an IT department. We spend 135 million next year on benefits costs for our 13,000 colleagues. We have a lot of big departments, a lot of moving pieces, a lot of complexity. I get one report a month, and that's the financials. Everything else, I want to be real time. If I ask for seven reports, 32 people have to write reports. And then they have to cause 120 people below them to write reports. 
And all of a sudden, the monthly reporting process become a huge drain every month on our business instead of taking care of customers. So don't write reports. If I don't have enough to fit time to figure out what's going on in the stuff I need to care about, and then let you worry about the stuff you need to care about, we're, we're confused. So we don't, we don't do monthly reports. We don't have any standing operational reviews. We don't bring everybody into room every month or every quarter and have them report out. And I, and I promise you we know what we're doing, even though some of this stuff sounds crazy. We, we are a very hands-on organization. We, we're a tough company to come into from the outside because we, we're not good at having somebody sit in the corner office and, and direct the business. You have to go get engaged. You better know how to operate a copier in our company or you are not going to make it. If I walk by a piece of paper on the floor, I should be fired. And I never tell anybody to pick up the piece of paper. I just never walk by it myself. And if I don't walk by it, you aren't walking by it, right? And that's the way we think the company operates. Do as I, as you see me do, not what I sit in a corner and write emails about. So we, we stay very much engaged. We do have some things that we've had to change over time um, for 16 years. The first 16 years of my career at Sedgwick, I had one COO. Uh, Jim was my business partner. We essentially co-led the business in the sense that we had 16 direct reports. And of those 16 direct reports that Jim and I both had, we said literally for 16 years, here's what you do. You come to Dave or Jim, mom or dad, with whatever question or issue you have. We hired you because we want you to do what we thought you could do. And I'm going to have a good day and a bad day. And I'm going to have stuff I'm more interested in and stuff that I'm less interested in. I'm a really good customer guy. I love the industry. I'm great at strategy. I'm great at innovation. Self-assessed, obviously. <laughs> and Jim was wonderful at mentoring and problems with people and stuff. Nobody would ever choose to come ask me how to coach somebody through a tough day. And nobody would ask him how to cut a deal with General Motors. So we said, you go to whoever you want, and we'll warrant it'll be OK. And we ran the company that way for 16 years. And then he retired. I don't understand that still. But um, so today, we've changed the org chart. And I have a few people to report to me. And the CEO has, COO has a few people to report to him. But other than that, we haven't changed many of the other um, things in our business. Um, as I said, we don't forget what we're all about. We're a service business. I, I've said that it's not complicated, but it is complex. We spend our time adjudicating the policies that you create. We spend the time trying to determine the laws and regulations of the states or the, or the ERISA plans that are written. And we take real, words, real, real world circumstances and try to figure it out between the two. And that's what our colleagues do for a living. So, for us, something had to go wrong today before we got to go to work, right? It's somebody had to get hurt or something had to burn down or we don't get to go to work. So performance or customer service is perceived differently, and you know this because the claims that are probably the bane of many of your existence when the phone rings is because something was bad and we have to get it neutral to get a chance to start getting good. We Claimants aren't happy with us just because we got them back to neutral. They expected that. Good customer service is next. It's something else. And it's answering the phone quickly is not getting us any points. It only gets us not yelled at. So customer service is redefined when it comes to um, dealing with people who have claims. Our business model is one of um, strong central control. Everything about our business, legal, finance, colleague resources, pricing, marketing is all centralized. It's all in Memphis, Tennessee. We don't, we don't delegate any of it to the field offices. We give them no responsibility for it. We give them no say in it. We set all the prices centrally. The opposite of that is we service our customers in the field. And just as I don't expect them to worry about how to manage an E&O claim or set price, I won't let anybody in corporate tell them how to take care of the customer. So as a result, things like hiring new people 
are not approved by corporate. Nobody in the corporate office knows better how to take care of the customer than the people in the field. So we draw a distinct um, difference between servicing the customer in the field and running the business centrally. As a result, we don't hold them accountable for things they have no control over. So we have no P&Ls in our $1.6 billion business at the local office level. I didn't give them the ability to set the price. I didn't give them the ability to choose where the office was going to be. I didn't give them the ability to vote on the benefit plan. So why in the world would I hold them accountable for the profit of just doing what we asked them to do, which was to take care of the customers? And we want to make a profit, and we're pretty good at it. So the model works for us. We just are clear about roles and responsibilities and who's accountable for what. Now I hold the head of real estate incredibly accountable for our real estate cost, but not the person who's occupying the desk because they didn't get to choose that. It's just how we think about it. We have become um, large, big. We're the largest in the world in the claims business now, which is kind of strange. Like many of your businesses, it was a very, very fragmented industry that had a lot, lot of mom and pop operations. When I first got to Sedgwick, the top seven third party administrators were all about 200 million in revenue. And we thought that was great. I mean, 200 million is huge numbers. That's what we should aspire to. We were 50, right? So if you could get to 200, that would be, wow, that's the Crawfords and the Gallaghers and all of these big companies. And when we got to 200 million, we, we realized that that wasn't very big at all. That just wasn't a lot of resources. There was, at 200 million, when you're a technology dependent company that's hiring a lot of people and growing, that's not a lot of money left over to invest in things. So we have companies the likes of FedEx and GM that are saying, hey, build some new technology. And we're over counting our pennies. We're going, we'd like to, but we can't. So we sort of set our sights that getting to a billion dollars was sort of that tipping point, if you will, that at around a billion dollars, we could change the industry in a small way. We could have enough money to invest in things that nobody had been able to do before. Think about some of these numbers. Last year, 2014, we hired 1,300 new people, all through growth. To hire 1,300 people, I don't know what the math is in your industry, in ours, to hire 1,300 people, you have to make offers to 3,000 people. To make offers to 3,000 people, you have to interview, you know, somewhere around 9,000 people. To interview 9,000 people, you have to see resumes on about 22,000 people. I don't know how many claims professionals you think exist in our industry, <laughs> but last year 22,000 of them sent me an application. And, and we're just one TPA in the industry. So it comes to the next issue that we think about a lot, and that's where are people coming into our business. Because next year, I need more than 22,000 people. <laughs> I can't even say those numbers. I'm glad my head of human resources isn't here. Um, so we do a lot of things. We have our own recruiters, full time, just ours. That's what we do. We have our own university. We run two brick and mortar training schools, one in Southern California and one here in Texas. We recruit from college campuses. We bring people in that have no idea what the insurance industry is. And we teach them how to get in the claims business. We call it the Industry Advancement Program, IAP. We named it intentionally because we knew a lot of them would not stay with us. They would think it's a great job out of college and they'll say, this is no way in hell I'm doing this. Or they'll go to our competitors or whatever, but if you're the leader, you gotta do this stuff, right? You, you've got, we need to invest in our industry, so that's one of the things that we think is really important. We're an industry that, well, let's talk about Cedric. In our in our company, and this is reflective of our industry, we're 73% female, 36% minorities, 51% of our colleagues are single, 26% of our single colleagues are single parents. If you think about those demographics for a second, it makes it a lot easier to think about things like benefit plans. You know, you don't debate a lot of stuff 
when half your colleagues, you know, are, are new families and they're raising families or 73% are females or 51% of them are single, some of these decisions get very easy to make. We also have a great insight into an industry that lacks a lot of inclusion. We don't lack a lot of diversity. We lack diversity at the senior levels in our, industry, our part of the industry, but we lack inclusion. So we are responsible for, we choose to be responsible for a lot of initiatives in our industry, which, which I believe all of us need to have. Where are we going to get the next group of human beings to come into our industry? You've just heard the last speaker to say how wonderful this business is, and, and hopefully you believe the same way, but we need to recruit people into this industry. So we have to be attractive in a whole variety of ways. To get 1,300 people to say yes, um, it takes a lot, and our 1,300 people aren't making those million dollar book of business. We don't, we don't pay them at that level. So you have to have a lot of other things about flexible work um, hours and work-life balance that, that are really important to people. Um, I, I wanted to tell you, I was asked to tell you a little bit about what's going on in our industry, in the claims industry, which, as I said, we, we are particularly proud of. I, um, like a lot of claims professionals, I went through my phase of my career where we were really mad at all of you. We, we believed you don't understand us, that you don't care about us, that, you know, the, the brokers had the fancy offices and the underwriters um, were the most respected and the claims people were down the hall or, you know, they're somewhere there. But, but we say, you know, but for us, what you do doesn't work. Right? If, if claims don't happen, you don't get to sell a policy because nobody would buy it. And when a claim happens at that moment, it's when every, all of those promises made come true or not. So we, we love this business um, that we have, and we love the position that the TPAs and the, the carrier-owned uh, claims professionals have moved to, and I think we're doing a lot of interesting things. So I'll tell you just a couple of those right now. And I speak for the industry, really, when I share this with you. Technology for us has finally become part of how we do business. I'm embarrassed to say, for the first couple of decades of my career in the industry, we were not, we did not embrace technology very well. For whatever the blamed reason is, we didn't invest in it very much, and the, the technology was very much behind. Today, we have technology and our competitors have technology that's as innovative as anything out there. We just recently, in the last couple of years, had the opportunity to do business with Apple Computer. And if Apple Computer can look at our technology, and I'm sure our competitors, and say, that's good stuff, you got to feel pretty good about where the industry has come. Because we have mobile apps and push information to claimants and a lot of productivity tools. We're investing in some strategies right now that I think are just fascinating. 50, in workers' compensation, 51% of our claims represent 1% of our clients' loss costs. All right? Look at your book sometime. 51% of the claim volume in workers' comp represents 1% of the loss cost. We spend 47% of the workers' compensation resources we have on those 51%. Because you gotta take in a claim, you gotta enter it into the system, you gotta report it to NCCI, you gotta do the three-point contact, you gotta do all the crap, we gotta send you reports, and you gotta do all that stuff. Imagine, imagine for a moment, you go into your boss and say, hey, I got a great idea. Listen, this is gonna be, this is gonna be great. I'm gonna spend 47% of our resources to solve 1% of our problem. <laughs> and 18% of the claims represent 80% of the costs. And so we and others in the TPA, in the claims industry, are looking at how do we change that dynamic? We've gotta find a way to use this technology that we now have to process those small, simple claims much more efficiently than we do today. That 51%, by the way, the average cost is $365. The largest claim in there is 500. If I totally screw it up, right, just botch it. Just don't answer the phone. Just ignore the report. Just do whatever I can to mess it. We wouldn't do that, right? You can write that down. But if, if we just totally screw it up, what's a $500 claim gonna be? 
600, 700, it's not going to be $5,000. It can't get there. And yet we spend 47% of our resources on it. And the claims that we know are going to be $50,000, we're not allocating resources as an industry correct. So we're spending a lot of time trying to figure out that equation and use what we now have as good data to go in and start predicting what's going to happen to the claim. So we talk a lot in our part of the business about predictive tech, uh, predictive analytics, and which is really just using what we know about those claims. And if it's going to be this way, no matter what we do, let's treat it that way and start lobbying NCCI and you and others to say, you know what, we just, you really don't. Three-point contact on that claim is just really a lot of wasted time. The doctors don't want to talk to us anyways. So we, we need to move on from that. Our regulatory environment is changing dramatically. A um, couple of examples of that that um, are most uh, that known to all of us, the Affordable Care Act. And the Affordable Care Act is a strange one because we don't do any group health claims. It's the only line of business we don't do. So you'd say, well, you're 51% workers' compensation, Affordable Care Act, there's no mention anywhere in that document about workers' compensation, so, so what? Move on. Affordable Care Act is changing the way health care is delivered in the United States. It is one of those issues that it does not matter, I don't think, what side of the aisle you're on. I don't care if you think it's the best piece of legislation that has ever hit the United States or the worst thing that's ever happened and you can't wait for the next election. Regardless, it is the current law and it is currently changing the way health care is delivered in the United States. And so since it does not mention work comp or auto or other things in it that care that we care a lot about, you have to look through it and say, well, is there anything there that can help us? And we think there's a lot there. It has in it a wellness plan. What could be better for workers than if they were healthier at work? Mitigates comorbidities and other claims. It has incentives in the law to help to cause doctors to treat better, have higher quality standards. It allows, it prevents hospitals from charging again for a readmission for the same thing. Well, we wish we had that in workers' compensation. So we're trying to find a way to say, okay, whether you love the law or not, is there a way for us to tap this change that's going on in healthcare in the country to deliver better results for all of us that are in the property casualty business, even though the law doesn't touch us as well? And so we're spending a lot of time. Our industry has an association, which is only about seven years old, if you can imagine. Think how long the carriers and agents and brokers have had professional associations. Claims administrators never did until about seven years ago. And so we now, as an association, we spend our time in Washington and at the various state houses. And all we're trying to do is get the legislators to say, the next time somebody walks into your office and says the word workers' comp, call somebody. Don't just say, and eh, move on. Just call one of us. We'll help you understand what the ramifications are. And that's starting to happen. We're starting to get good response out of Washington and a variety of states that are taking some feedback about how, um, how the legislation ought to be developed. Medicare set-aside is another uh, piece of legislation. It was, um, it's been around for a long time where Social Security and Medicaid and Medicare are secondary payers. It's always been the law, but in, in the most recent five or six years, new legislation causes us to have to consider their future position as we settle claims. And the law was not crafted very well. It was just administratively very hard and very burdensome on closing out work comp and liability claims. So we're spending a lot of time as an industry working with Washington trying to get the Medicare Set-Aside Act and modified to allow us to settle the claims that should be readily and easily um, settled. I wanted to um, today tell you a little bit about the insurance, our side of the insurance industry, a little bit aside of the private equity, uh, a company that actually likes the private equity world. And I don't know what will happen with Sedgwick in the next CEO takes over because it, it will be the next one if they go public because it won't be me. But for now, the, the private equity world is a good play for us in the claims industry. It allows us to focus on our colleagues, focus on our customers, 
It's an industry that we think has had a lot of innovation going on in technology, a lot of leadership roles available to us in terms of recruiting a diversified workforce, bringing new people into our industry, and we're very proud of a, the small role that we play in your industry of being the ones that make those policies work. So I want to thank you all for having me and for listening to our story today. Thank you.